Church, I love that we have, let's see, five services, seven, seven services every Sunday on two campuses in two locations of this campus. Uh, but this one is one of my favorites, and I'll tell you why. You might not even notice, but we have a number of our differently abled adults who come into the worship time, left at the name of Jesus, and then many uh, depart after that to go to their own lesson, that sort of thing. But our, our special needs ministry here is a blessing to every single one of us. Because I think it, one of the things it does is reminds us of how much we all need the Lord and how to get over ourselves, you know, that we're, we don't have to have a perfect environment in order to lift up the name of Jesus. And when you watch some of our friends uh, worshiping the Lord in this service, it's just such a special blessing. So I love our special needs ministry at Kingsland, and I love that we get to share worship with them at 11 o'clock. So... Uh, some of you know, last month, Lana and I had the opportunity to travel to Scotland, and that was because of your kindness. You sent us there to celebrate our 10th anniversary uh, here at Kingsland, and we had a great time. On the last uh, couple of days, we made a, a decision to adjust our plans a little bit. Lana went home as planned on the day we were going to travel, and I just spent one extra day where I adjusted the plans to go uh, across to Belgium to visit and encourage a friend who's living over there. And so I made a, a last-minute uh, plane ticket purchase uh, with one of the regional airlines there just looking for the cheapest ticket. And I found one and uh, it was like, I don't know what it was, but it was like $200 more for business class. Well, I wasn't going to do that, but I was curious because when they assigned me the ticket, it was row two. I thought row two, but there's a business class. Maybe they, they have rows A through E or something in business class. Who knows? It was just odd. So when I got on the plane, I was surprised to see that actually, no, I was literally on row two. Like there's the door, then there's the front row, and then I'm sitting there. And sure enough, there was a business class, but the people in business class were just row one. They had the exact same amount of leg room as me, same <laughs> seats and everything, but they did have this placard that demonstrated that they were in business class. And I just wondered if these people were especially put out that they dropped an extra $200. So either they had, uh, they had some money burning a hole in their pockets or they'd made some really bad assumptions. And so what I want to talk about today has to do with worldview and some of the really bad assumptions that people are making today about God and Christianity and the Bible that are so prevalent sometimes we think, well, is that true or am I crazy? And the cost of getting these assumptions wrong is a lot worse than the difference in price between uh, coach and business class. And so Paul talks about these in the scripture, and that's what we're going to look about to look at today. Is belief in Christianity reasonable? Is is atheism really the option of the intelligence uh, community? Well, I, I said intelligent community, not intelligence community. Like spies or atheists. That's not what I mean. Um, Paul's answering some of those same questions in Romans. Would you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter one? Romans, the first chapter. As you're turning there, let me remind you, we kicked off our Wednesday night classes this last Wednesday. It was a wonderful time on both campuses. And if you were not a part of it, it's not too late. You can still sign up, register, and dive right in this Wednesday and I encourage you to do so. I say a special word to our students and children in the room. Your generation is probably facing more opposition to Christianity than any other generation in the room. Like you're, you're surrounded by some really bad ideas or people questioning things that we used to think are foundation or obvious. And sometimes it can be disorienting. I want you to know that you can have more confidence in what you believe than ever in the history of mankind. And also when you look at the facts, you find that the foolishness is on the side of unbelief. And that's what I want to talk about today that Paul really lays out here in the book of Romans. I'm going to begin with verses 16 and 17 because it sort of lays the foundation for what we'll talk about. And you're going to see it's actually absurd not to believe. Verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So you might look at these two verses and, and recognize he's saying this is how to be saved. We're saved by grace through faith. And the next following verses talk about what we're saved from. So Romans 1 and 2 outlines really an indictment 
of those who have ignored the evidence for God. And when you look at the evidence, you have to come away with a confidence in the Bible. Uh, listen, I recognize some of you who come today and you come because a friend invited you and if you're not doing it out, outwardly, you're doing it inwardly, you have your arms crossed, your arms folded, you're like, I don't buy any of this stuff, but I came to make mom happy or something like that. Listen, I want you to know, you've come on the perfect day because what we're gonna see is that there's reason to be confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the word gospel means? Good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. It actually supersedes everything else, all the other theories, all the stuff out there. When you look at it and you look at the alternatives, you find that that is the path to sanity, not the other way around. In this passage, Paul outlines three follies of unbelief that pervade any culture that has forgotten God. It certainly applied to the first century in Rome. And I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say it applies to our culture today. Do you? I mean, that we have a culture who's kind of more and more just saying, hey, listen, we don't even need this stuff anymore. This is a crutch. And Paul's saying, hold on just a second, because we're going to identify the real foolishness, all right? Three follies of those who don't follow God. Uh, the first folly of unbelief has to do with ignoring the truth of God, the truth of God. It's the foolishness of relativism. Now, to outline this, I want you to notice a contrast in the next portion of Scripture because Paul has just said the righteousness of God is revealed. Do you see that? What does it mean for something to be revealed? It means it was hidden and then it's known. So the righteousness of it revealed, and what's the source of that revelation or that revealing? It is faith. And he says from beginning to end, from faith to faith. In other words, this is what launched the Reformation. It's not like it starts from works and then to faith or faith and then works. It's all faith. It's all about the grace of God and counting on what Jesus Christ has done. The righteousness is being revealed that way. And that's why this wording is especially important. Next, verse 18 says, for God's wrath is revealed. There's that word again. This time, it's not the righteousness of God that is revealed, but God's wrath. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godless, godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. You see, he's saying that there's foolishness in ignoring reality here. Notice it doesn't say that God's wrath will be revealed. This is not talking about hell or the last days or that sort of judgment. He's saying the wrath will be revealed anytime in the present tense that a culture or a home or a heart says there is no God or there is no truth of God and I'm gonna choose my own truth. How does God's wrath reveal itself in this way? The answer is in a phrase in verses 24, 26, and 28. As he goes through this progression or digression, he says, therefore, God delivered them over. Do you see that? When I think of God's wrath, maybe like you, I think of, of brimstone or, or cataclysmic events. What he describes here, he said, the wrath of God is being revealed, and he talks about this hands off. Basically, God says, that's what you want? You want to choose your own truth? I'll leave you to it. You think about the account of the prodigal son. Prodigal son made bad decision after bad decision. Then one day he comes to the father and says, give me my share of the inheritance. The father's brokenhearted, but the father grants him his wish. The most ominous words you can hear from God are, your will be done. That's what you want. That's what you get. And so life without God, life lived by your own truth happens next when God's wrath is revealed and the results are devastating. Verse 22 sort of sums it up. Claiming to be wise, they become fools. All of a sudden, we repeat something long enough, it starts to sound interesting. And he's saying, if you take a God's eye view, it's nonsense. You invent a truth, you make it sound so good that you can claim it as a new morality and you end up with one of the most common phrases we hear today. What you believe is good for you, but I have my own truth. This, of course, is absurd. If there is truth at all, there must be a standard of truth. 
If there's a standard of truth, which there obviously is, there has to be a creator of the standard of the truth, uh, one who, who has created that. If God doesn't exist, objective moral values don't exist. But obviously they do. You can go anywhere in the world. You can go to any faith. You can go to any background. You're going to find people when they are harmed that say that's wrong. Why? Because it's deeply embedded in us. Paul's saying, you know what's right. It's why Paul said in verse 18, when people commit evil acts, people will suppress the truth or seek to suppress the truth. That literally means to push down from above. You just hide in it. Why do people hide it? Because they know it's wrong. Nobody has to tell them that. That's why so much that we think of as carousing or, or crime or sin occurs at night. People want to hide it, at least for a while. And then when you manufacture your own truth, things never get better, do they? Society slowly declines. In verse 21, their thinking became worthless. In other words, we think we sound intelligent with complicated justification for sin, but Paul's saying, no, you sound like idiots eventually. By verse 25, we exchange the truth of God for a lie. It leads to all sorts of evil and perversion, and we end up calling evil good and good evil. And finally, when moral conscience has been seared, and we honestly have lied to ourselves so long that we lose our moral compass, verse 32, here's what happens. Although they knew God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they even applaud others who practice them. So now society turns a corner. It sees hiding didn't take the pain away, and so now we have to twist our sin and pretend like it's something to be celebrated. Have you ever wondered why a few years ago, we used to have people saying they just wanted to live their lives and if people would just live them alone and, and not harm them, then we could all be better off. We said, well, nobody wants to harm anybody. Okay, I buy that. But that's not how it is anymore because suddenly there's a demand for months and parades and celebration and all these things to celebrate whatever sin somebody has chosen. Why? Because there is a desire to make it sound better, to suppress it to turn everything upside down. Paul's reminding us, no matter how many parades we have, we all have a moral compass. And by the way, instead of just thinking about whoever or whatever sin you're thinking of, think about how we can do this in our own lives. Relativism. There must be some truth. Not everything can be true. It doesn't make any sense. Ironically, if somebody asserts to you that there is no truth, and they absolutely think it's wrong or bigoted for you to have a truth, they're breaking their own law because they're saying there absolutely is no truth and you must believe exactly what I believe. You see how ridiculous that is? It's not, not everything can be right. In logic, we call this the law of non-contradiction. Two contradictory statements cannot both be true in the same sense at the same time. So it, you don't get to choose without being really intellectually lazy. You don't get to choose none of the above. I don't believe any of this stuff. And you can't choose all the above. Oh, I just choose all this stuff. No, you can't. When it comes to truth, it's nonsense. If only one is right, now you have to ask a question. Okay, who's right? So let me just take this one sermon within a sermon. You need to ask a few questions. Which faith backs up its claims with hundreds of fulfilled prophecies, hundreds. Which book revealed hundreds of realities that science did not discover until much later and continues to do? Which faith has a Messiah who changed the world and then rose from the grave with hundreds of eyewitnesses? There's only one, only Christianity. Jesus not only claimed to be God, he claimed to be the only path to God. And so every person on earth must determine what he or she is going to do with Jesus to start out with, you see? So the idea of relativism is foolishness, Paul says. And ironically, these are the claims people are bringing. Well, you're trying to isolate truth. And he's saying it's absurd for you to say there's no right and wrong. Here's the second folly of unbelief. It involves ignoring the fact of God. It's the foolishness of atheism. So right in the midst of this conversation about the absence of truth, Paul takes it a step further to talk about the absence of God. And he's implying that ignoring truth will eventually lead to ignoring the fact of God. And so now Paul attacks those who deny God's existence. 
Look back at verse 18 with me. And we need to read this to kind of lead up, ramp up to verse 20. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There it is again. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. And not only are we talking about the conscience of the heart, watch this, for his invisible attributes that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. He's saying basically the existence of God is obvious and people take great pains to adhere to the belief of no existence of God. Why? Because it's so much more convenient to be your own God, isn't it? Paul gives two reasons why discarding the fact of God makes no sense. First, he talks about the fact of creation. The fact of creation. The fact that there is creation points to a creator. Some of you have had uh, a child tell you or a grandchild ask you a question, something like this. If God created everything, who created God? It's a really good question. And there's a great answer. What comes into existence needs to be created. In short, we need to understand God doesn't come into existence. He is eternal so he doesn't need to be created. This is called the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown them. The universe did come into existence. We can see this around us. Science is on our side. The Big Bang is proof that the universe had a beginning. And if it had a beginning, then it needs a beginner. And what science cannot answer, the Bible can. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So Paul points to the fact of creation, and then he points to the intricacy of creation. Not only is there creation, obviously, but the vastness and detail around us demonstrate this could not have happened just spontaneously. In fact, the more we know about science, the more advancements that are made, the more absurd it becomes to assume stuff just evolved or appeared, much less life. Verse 20 again, for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. This eternal power, that's the only explanation. As a result, people are without excuse. Everywhere you turn in nature, there's majesty, there is beauty, there are patterns. Imagine if you could travel at the speed of light. Wouldn't that be nice? If you could do so, you could uh, travel around the earth in 0.11 seconds. You could travel to the moon in 0.3 seconds. That's 240,000 miles away. It would take you 8.3 minutes to go to the sun, 13.7 days to go to Pluto, 4.3 years to go to the nearest star. And to put it into perspective, at the speed of light, that same speed, it would take you 100,000 years to cross our galaxy. You want to talk about vastness? It's estimated today with the limits that we have, a telescope, um, science, and the ability to look into our universe. It's estimated we have 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Galaxies. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure or weighed the mountains on a balance and the hills on the scales? I love that passage because it talks about the span of his hand, the palm of God's hand. He's measuring this. It's no big deal to God. This is the majesty of our creator. And everywhere we look, that's what we see. And of course, we not only see the vastness, but we see the detail. You can go smaller and smaller and smaller, and it makes less and less sense to ignore the existence or the creation of God. This refers to the teleological argument for God. Anything that has a design must have a designer. The intricacy of creation. There's beauty that cannot be explained by chance. And what some would propose through time is they say, well, what you're not accounting for is if there are billions and billions of years, then these random acts could be found in the randomness so that they appear in that way. But that makes even less sense. If you have billions of years, the impossible is still impossible. And here's why. Even if something could happen by chance over millions or billions of years, it would not happen by chance in sequence, in order, do you see? There has to be a very specific in time sequence for all these things to happen, for any of these things to happen. 
And so if you're assuming that things are going to happen by chance simultaneously, you're adhering to nonsense. And I don't mean nonsense in the sense of an insult. I'm saying it's literally nonsense. What are the odds if there were dots of paint, drops of paint that fell from the sky, that they would fall on a canvas and paint the Mona Lisa? What are the, what are the odds of that taking place? They're not slim. They're none. What are the odds that that happens over billions of years? It's still impossible because of the sequence, do you see? And the, the onus of the argument gets even more foolish because what we'd have to ask in this illustration is what are the odds that paint randomly fell from the sky in the first place and there was a canvas randomly on the ground in the first place, right? That's what you have to believe. It's far more complicated than that. It takes immense faith to look at the evidence and assume that what has happened around us was an accident, which brings Paul to make his assertion. We are without excuse to assume there is no God. Do you see? There's a reason Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because all these other estimates and postulations, that's what we should be ashamed of. They make no sense. The only reasonable assumption is that there is a God. And when we say otherwise, it is folly. It's absurd. One final Foolish argument that Paul addresses here that we cannot ignore. It's the third folly of unbelief. It's ignoring the grace of God. This is the foolishness of moralism. Now, here's where people might even concede that there's a God. They might even concede that there is an objective, universal truth. But they fall short. For this, we have to move to chapter 2. Now, uh, as we move to chapter 2, just the first three verses, I want you to understand, many believe that chapter 1 is outlining the, uh, the indictment against the Gentiles and the foolishness of the Gentiles, those who were not raised uh, according to the Old Testament or don't know the Bible at that time. And chapter 2 is beginning to address the foolishness of the Jews or at least the religious Gentiles or Greeks at the time, because he says, maybe you read the first part of this letter and you thought, man, what idiots. They don't believe in truth and they don't believe this. And Paul's saying, not so fast, because listen, if you will adhere to or recognize that there's a God and there's truth and yet somehow come away thinking that you don't need a savior, you're just as foolish if you think you can get to heaven on your own. Verses 1 through 3 of Romans 2 say this. Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. Now, we know that God's judgment on, God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you think any one of you who judges, who do such things, yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? So, you see, in this case... He's saying, you might believe these other things, but if you think that your hope of salvation and your access to heaven will be just being better than those in chapter one, it's just as absurd. This is the foolishness maybe that's the most common in the church. It goes something like this. Well, don't you know, I'm a member of Kingsland. I'm a volunteer over here in this one department. I give to these ministries. Don't you know, I take care of my family. Surely surely I'm okay with God. That's not the way it works. I uh, often rent cars with Avis, and when you go out to the Avis parking lot, they have their motto there under their logo, and you know what it says, anybody? We try harder. Well, that's great. If you're renting a car, I want them to try harder. But it's a really bad theology. How are you going to get to heaven? Well, we try harder. Nope. Nope. Our, Our righteousness is as filthy rags. So the problem is thinking you're just a little bit better than the next guy is that if you committed one sin in your life, you're guilty. In fact, you were born into sin already. You were already condemned. And if you had not been, you would have worked it out on your own, I promise you. We're in trouble. We desperately need a Savior, do you see? You can be in church your whole life and still fall short of the glory of God. And if you don't count on Jesus and run to Jesus, you're dead as a doornail. You're actually destined for an eternity apart from God. Folks, this is why our our mission as a church is inviting people to experience true fulfillment in Jesus Christ one home at a time. And we're not uh, living by the mission, inviting people to experience true fulfillment of good behavior one home at a time. Our goal is not moralism. You know why? 
If our whole goal is to help our neighbors be more moral, we'll just populate hell with nicer people. <laughs> the goal is to acknowledge our sin and the need for a savior. I am quite certain that someone within the sound of my voice has maybe been in church your whole life and you've bought into this foolishness somewhere along the way. Well, I just, I would never deny God and I get the truth, but I'm just trying to try my best to make it work. You know, to earn the good deeds, get the badges so I can be in heaven. No, there's a reason why Paul said, I am not ashamed of what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the power of God under salvation. Do you see? The gospel. I wonder whether somebody maybe came today and you know in your heart of hearts you've never trusted Christ. Maybe because you bought into one of these lies that's so prevalent today and you, you've started to think, well, that other stuff is kind of foolishness. You know, maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adhere to this other thing. I don't, I don't know about Christianity. Do you understand that when you take a good hard look at it, when you're honest with yourself, when you ask the hard questions and really seek the answers, why Paul can assert all the rest of this is absurdity and the only thing worth standing on is the gospel of Jesus Christ? That salvation is available to everybody. I wonder if somebody needs to come to faith today. Also, I wonder if some of you are Christians and yet you found yourself kind of back on your heels saying, man, it's coming from all directions. The people at school or work or in my neighborhood, they're saying these things and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, they read an article online. It must be true. You should laugh at that. That's, 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 that's the logic. That's the logic of some people. No. No. Be ready to give an answer in defense of what you believe. Heard a story that kind of sums up, I think, our culture a few years ago. There was a family of mice, and they lived inside, deep in the recesses of a grand piano. And uh, they just got used to life there, and even though they could not see him, they took great comfort in the beautiful music of an unseen player. They couldn't see him, but they knew he was nearby. One day, one bold mouse uh, explored a part of the piano they'd never been to, and he came back to report something earth-shattering. He said, you won't believe it, but I found a different source of music than we all thought all this time. I discovered strings. They don't come from, the music doesn't come from an unseen player. It comes from some strings just above us. We don't have to believe in an unseen player at all. As time went on, there were other explorers who'd go out and they'd come back with more information about hammers that were beating on the strings or the vibration of the strings that were causing all these things. And we can have faith in mechanics and all these things. There's no reason to have the crutch of the unseen player anymore. And yet, even as they postulated and theorized and came up with all these ideas, the reality was the unseen player continued to play, regardless of these theories. That's exactly where we find ourselves, folks. You can be confident in the truth of God's word. If you've been trusting in anything else, I pray that it would be revealed today as the foolishness that it is and you'd come to Jesus. Would you bow with me? In a moment, we'll have an opportunity to respond to this message, but I wonder whether right now you'd allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your own heart Maybe you're here and you know you've never trusted Jesus. Why not place your faith in him today? Maybe God's put some people in your life who have, uh, you thought until now, kind of been standing on the intellectual high ground. And it's time to go back and have some honest conversations, not debates, but good discussions to ask the hard questions of them right back and invite them to know the Jesus that you know. Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your word. I pray, Lord, that you'd move us to decision now. I ask this, Lord, in Christ's name, amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan Rush here, and I just want to thank you for being with us at Kingsland Online today. What an honor. But I'll tell you what would be even better. We'd love to see you get connected with the physical church in the days ahead, if you haven't already. And that means maybe if you're local in the West Houston area, we'd love to see you at Kingsland. Otherwise, regardless, we'd love to help you facilitate uh, jumping into a local church near you, and we can do that together. You can go to kingsland.org slash online connect, kingsland.org slash online connect to find out next steps on your journey. Listen, thanks again for being with us today at Kingsland Online.